Well, good morning to each of you. I, um, uh, quite an intro there, Mark. I appreciate that. <laughs> it is certainly a pleasure to be back again. And, uh, you know, uh, whenever I get invited back, I'm not necessarily sure why. Uh, I don't know if it was so good they want more if it, or if it was so bad they want to give me a second chance. <laughs> so either way, I'm just glad to be here. But I appreciate uh, uh, Pastor Brandon inviting me back uh, this month and, um, and for the relationships that have uh, uh, been uh, fostered over the past few months with the rest of the staff. And, and uh, good to see you guys here and uh, certainly to reconnect with Mark and Debbie. Uh, from uh, our time at, uh, at Liberty Church in Fairfield. But great to be back with you guys. And um, yeah, I, I, now honestly, I did think, okay, all right, so how do, you, how do you come back after flies and butterflies? Like what other, what other parts of the animal kingdom can we talk about today or, or the insect world? Uh, but we're not going to talk about any of that today. I, I, in, the, in the midst of this month of, uh, of December, obviously we're, we're highlighting the, the birth of Christ as we come towards the day that we've chosen to celebrate uh, his, his birth. Um, and I believe that there are some things that God wants to share uh, from his heart today. And, but I will tell you this, if you are a note taker like I am, I want to encourage you not to take notes. I want to encourage you not to take notes today. Um, but to take notes the second time you hear it, which means you'll need to hear it again. And the reason why is because I believe that there are some things God wants you to catch with your heart today, that when you try to take notes, you, you, your heart disengages and your mind is trying to keep track of what you heard so you can write it down and repeat it and you, you've missed the moment. And, and if you're a note taker like I am, you know that that's, that's the case. You, 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 you're writing down one thing and you miss what it, the thing that was just said. And, but, I, but I think there's something that God wants you just to catch today uh, in your heart. And, and in your spirit, and, uh, and as we go through this message, you'll, you'll see why. When I was uh, uh, younger, I mean, I, I grew up in church. My dad was a pastor, and he was a chaplain in the Air Force, and then a pastor, and, and I was a chaplain in the Air Force as well. Um, and, but, but growing up, uh, I, you know, you learn these different Christian songs, and you learn Bible verses, and you know, from kids ministry on up, and 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 as you as you get older, you see that there are Christians who uh, who know a lot of scriptures, and Christians who who serve in different capacities and are leaders and this and that. Um, but then when you look at Jesus's standard of love, and you look at some of those same Christians, you don't see that love there. And so it was kind of a, uh, a quandary for me uh, as I looked not just at other people, but at myself. At the amount of, amount of Bible knowledge I had accumulated over some years, um, went, through, went through seminary, still in seminary, working on my, my doctorate now, which I'm not sure that was the Lord. Uh, <laughs> like, like, man, this... <laughs> This paper's supposed to be 100 pages, Jesus. What, what was I thinking? So, um, but, but, but that's, that's, that's one kind of like, like sector, you know, formal education. But, but even outside of that, you can, you can gain a lot of, of Christian experience. You can gain a lot of Bible knowledge and still not be like Jesus. So why is that? The one thing that Jesus said the world will know us by is the one thing we struggle to do, to love genuinely. I mean, I'm not talking like, like act like we can all act. We all, we all know how to act. Right? How are you doing that? Oh, I'm just blessed in the Lord. I'm ble You're going through hell. Tell somebody. <laughs> just tell somebody. Just be real. Be honest. Appreciate the 
the transparency, <laughs> Pastor, Pastor Bob's so like, yeah, exactly, right? Well, we got, we, got, we got things that are, that are challenging for us, that how we respond to people, how we respond to challenges and obstacles, and we, and we don't, have to, we don't have, to, have to act like Christians. That's not what Jesus Christ died for us to, to have and died for us to be. He, he really changes people from the inside out. The power of the gospel is the power of transformation. And when you're really transformed, you don't need acting lessons. When you, when you think of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 23, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, joy, right? Self-control, okay, thanks for adding that one. Um, no, it's in there. It's, it's in mine too. It's in, I, I read it. And you think of all these fruit, you know, and I've taught lessons on the fruit of the spirit. But what I learned was if I teach you what joy is, do you get it after that? Does that bring you joy for me to teach you what joy is for me to illustrate what joy is for me to define what joy is? What about peace? If I teach you what your life would look like if you had peace, if, if I define peace, if I define the fruit of the Spirit, does that make you produce it? The answer is no. I mean, I, I've determined I'm, I'm just not ever preaching on the fruit of the Spirit ever again. <laughs> and that was not even a joke. Because if the Spirit of God does not produce it in you, you won't have it no matter what I say. And if the Spirit of God is producing it in you, you don't need a lesson from me on it. <laughs> right? It, but, but the implication is if I, if I teach you this thing, you can learn to have it. You can. If the Spirit's not producing it, you can. And there's a lot of things, my Christian brothers and sisters, that we're trying to learn our way into. You can't learn your way into something that requires you to be transformed to get there. One of the things that Jesus said, because uh, I'm going to read a scripture here to make this all official. For <laughs> some of you are nervous. It's, it's been 10 minutes. He hasn't quoted the Bible yet. That was a joke. I'm kidding. Calm down. One of the things he says in, in John chapter 14, verse 18, he says, he says, I, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you as orphans. Now, the implication is, if he's saying I'm not going to leave you as orphans, the implication is that's what you are right now. Those who he was talking to, that, that's, what, that's what they were right now. So I'm going to come to you. Because the reason why I came here, the reason why the Father sent me, is so that you wouldn't be orphans anymore, but that you would be sons and daughters of God. That you'd be a part of the family of God. That you'd be grafted in. That you'd become children of God. And so uh, that's why Paul says in Romans 5, 6, I like the New Living Translation that says it this way. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. So Jesus is sent by God the Father to come into this world. And the whole Christmas story you see in Luke chapter 2 is a baby in a manger and the angels singing and the shepherds coming and the whole scene, right? All so we could be his children. All so we can be his family. But most of us in here are saved. We're children of God. And for us, the issue is now not salvation as much as it is maturity maturity 
And the interesting paradox of spiritual growth as it is compared to physical growth is that in physical growth, physical maturity is gauged by how well a child can now develop to things that they're able to do independently. Uh, one of my daughters is, uh, is nine months old, and you know, there's different stages of development. Like every day is a discovery. And we get excited when she's able to do something new. Oh, look, she turned over. <gasps> oh, look, she's crawling. <sighs> every little thing that she's able to now do on her own, it's a stage of progress, maturity, development. Oh, she's now eating on her own. Not, not nine months, now I'm a three-year-old. She eats on her own, right? We measure maturity by independence. Things you can do on your own. So some of you have older children, and they want to they wanna learn how to drive. Right? Mommy, daddy, the law says <laughs> I'm old enough to learn how to drive. Now, you live with the child. <laughs> you have other standards of maturity. And you might say, I know what the law says. There's a number there. But the law is assuming that by the time you hit this number, there's a level of maturity. You want to drive but can't clean your room. I, I, we, need to t we need to have a conversation here <laughs> about what is maturity and when are you ready to be independent so so physical growth physical maturity is going from a child to an adult from being totally dependent to being totally independent can you live on your own can you pay your bills can you get out of my house <laughs> ah, that's the more independent you are, the more mature we see you are physically. But in the spiritual, we start off independent. And independence is immaturity. And now, so, so in the physical, we grow from, from being a child that way to being an adult from being fully dependent to being fully independent. But spiritually, we grow. We grow. Progress, maturity is in the opposite direction. We grow from being independent of God to learning to be fully dependent on him. So Jesus says, now look, if you're going to receive the kingdom, you got to accept it like a little child. You got to go this way. Now, what is it about, about going that way that's so significant to maturity? When Jesus comes as a little baby in a manger, the Savior of the world, it seems like some kind of contradiction. How could he be king in diapers? Where's his army? Where's his nation? Where's his physical kingdom? And there were some that as they heard about the story, it offended their mind for him to be called the king. And there were others, when they heard about the story, they were humble. Wise men coming from the east, bringing gifts to honor this. Though he was a baby, they recognized him as king. The shepherds came. Man, the angels just announced to us, he's here. Here's where I think the, the connection is. The shift has to take place. Guys, this is it right here. There are a lot of things that God does that do not make sense, but it's still God. 
Anyone else experience that, or, or is he just trying to confuse me? Okay. Our minds, our minds that we use to fill with information, knowledge, understanding, our minds have a very limited capacity. And there's really nothing else in the world that confronts us with the limitations of our intellect and mental capacity as much as God. Because there are a lot of other things we can understand. Given enough time, we can figure some things out. Given enough time, we can discover them. Given enough time, we can explain them. Given enough time, we can understand them. And so we oftentimes use this to try to also understand God. And what we cannot understand about God with our mind, we just say is just mysterious. We, he, he doesn't want us to know that about him because we can't understand it here. Pastor Brendan, if you can give me that picture that's right there. Thank you. This is our heart. Which one do you want to learn about God with? Our heart has the capacity to go deeper in God than our minds do. We can receive things with our heart that we can't receive with our mind. And so many of us in this room, you can describe an experience that you had with God where he impacted you here and you're still trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> when we're kids... We're trusting with this. We're open with this. We lead with this. We discover we're not afraid of stuff. Our heart is searching out some things. That's why a kid can, can climb on something that's dangerous. You, you, you know it's dangerous because you learned. You've fallen a few times been hurt a few times. They haven't had that yet. They just, they just explore. And Jesus says, you got to receive the kingdom here. But over time, as we grow in our lives, we, we've, been, we've offered this to people and they didn't treat it right. We've trusted people and they broke our trust. They betrayed us. They offended us. They hurt us. They rejected us. They disappointed us. And we learned not to put our heart front. We have to guard it. So now let me analyze you first before I let you in. Let me see what you're all about first before I trust you. Let me check you out first. And we'll call this discernment. This isn't discernment. This is judgment. Discernment comes from the Holy Spirit. Judgment comes from your brokenness. Try to defend myself. Try to protect myself. When the Bible says guard your heart, he's not talking about it here. Guard with truth that comes from his spirit. But we go, we, we, everything here. Right, we learn in our relationships. We're checking people out with our minds. And then the problem comes when we encounter God. When we meet Jesus, we go, let me see. <laughs> let me see. Mm, I don't know. I, I, I prayed a prayer one time and he didn't answer that prayer. I'm not so sure. I'm going to 
pray again. I prayed for my loved one and they still passed away. I'm not sure I'm going to believe in healing no more. That's here. You're trying to guard yourself. And you, you will limit how far you go with God if you lead with this in your relationship with him. This has limits that your heart doesn't have. So the challenge for us is to go, you know what, God? There are some things I don't understand. I don't understand, but I know this. I need to be here. Because if I try to go here, if I try to just learn Bible knowledge, and then try to, based on what I learned in my mind, try to teach my heart that, that's going to be slow. And I'm not going to be changed. When my, when my walk with God is all here, I can quote Bible scriptures from Genesis to Revelations. I could even quote you the maps in the back. <laughs> and still hate you. And still be irritable. And still not like people. People just get on my nerves. You know, but you know what the Bible says. No, see, you just... <laughs> right? Is it has it has this not been a mystery for some of you? How some people can know all this stuff, but their attitudes suck. Like you don't even want to be around them. Like, how is this possible? This is how it's possible. They have it here. And haven't been changed here. That's how it's possible. That's not what Jesus Christ died for. The Pharisees had it here. And Jesus called them out on it. You, you search the scriptures because you think in the scriptures, that's where your revelation is. And I'm standing right here in front of you. And you can't see me because you're not looking with this. You're like whitewashed tombs on the outside. You look clean, but on the inside, you're filled with dead man's bones. The Pharisees had this problem, and some Christians today have this problem, and you think that growing closer with God is getting more of this. He's like, no, it's this. And this is why a brand new believer who doesn't know much about the scriptures can be so loving and on fire for Jesus, be filled with faith because they got it here. So when you pursue God here and you let what you experience here in your heart, you let that change your mind. That's how your mind is renewed. Here. So when Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, he's not saying, I'm going to give you a bunch of information. He's saying, I'm going to change you here. This is where sonship is. This is where we become sons and daughters of God. And there's a lot of things that God will do that we cannot understand. When, when, so when we have that person that we prayed for and they still pass away and we still believe in healing, it's because we believe here. And the disappointments don't change us. Rejections by people don't change us. Whether people love us or hate us, it doesn't change us because he has changed us here. Christians who can just have it here, these are the ones that can fall away. They just had it here. So all you need to fall away from Christianity here is someone with a better argument, someone with better debate skills than you do. But when you got Jesus here, Somebody can argue around you, debate, and you can lose a debate, but you know what? It's like, you know, I, I can't explain what you just said, but I'm a follower of Jesus. That's all I know. I don't even, I don't even know what you're talking about right now. But I, but, I, but, I, but I know this. I got him here. He changed me, and nothing you can say can change his change. And so when we pursue God, Got to understand, he's going to offend us here. You know why the atheists are stuck? The atheists are stuck here. If God is real, he should be understandable. 
If God is real, he should be in my box. I should be able to explain him and see him and understand him with this, and God will not do it this way. Fortunately, you have people like Lee Strobel who searched God with this and got changed here. They wrote a whole book, Case for Christ. And so when Jesus comes in a manger, and this is God's plan to save people, it's not something that makes a whole lot of sense. But the shepherds got it here. The wise men got it here. All throughout his ministry, you see the difference in people trying to get it here and others who try to get it here. If you and I are going to grow in Christ, it's got to be here. And I know this is tough for some. I mean, some of us were just critical, analytical. You know, we like just as I like me. If I'm applying for a job, they say, "What's your hobbies?" Thinking. So I do it for fun. <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm thinking about why you wore them shoes right now. I'm thinking. I'm just <laughs> so guys, I get it. I get it. And God has blessed us with intelligent minds. But our minds have a different capacity than our hearts. Think about this. Think about this. As we look all through, all through Scripture, uh, you see where uh, God is, has sent Samuel to go and to pick the next king of Israel after Saul's successor, and all of Jesse's sons all line up, and some of them look like they'd be the king. And Samuel, an experienced prophet, has to learn a lesson from God when God tells him, Samuel, the ones you're seeing right now, they're, they're not it. They're somebody else. Man looks on the outside what makes sense, what seems reasonable. Man looks here at people. Man judges people superficially. I look at the heart. Right? Isn't that what he said? I look at the heart. In Ezekiel chapter 36 God says, I am going to, 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 to change uh, the inner climate of my shepherds. I am going to give my people shepherds that have a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. He's concerned about the heart. When you look at different listings in scripture, uh, what's, what's more prominent or, or, or primary or dominant comes first. And so when you see uh, the, the listing of the disciples, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. Peter was more dominant in his personality. When you see Paul writing to the Thessalonians, guys, I want you all to be completely whole in your spirit, soul, and body in that order. It's in the listing uh, order of importance. And then when Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, he says, this is how I want you to love God. Love the Lord your God with all your. Yeah. Heart, mind, soul, and strength. Heart, heart, heart. Jesus said, hey, guys, you know, you, you, you've heard it said that if you, uh, if, you, if you commit adultery, you know, that ain't cool. But I'm telling you, if you even think, if you even look at another person to lust after them, you've committed adultery in your heart. You've heard it said, don't murder people. It ain't right. <laughs> but I'm telling you, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. The heart, the heart. And when you think about um, uh, the teachings of Jesus, you'll see this theme that your heart is always his target. He's always trying to make your heart like his. 
Guys, listen, it's not what goes, what, 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 what you eat, what goes in a person that defiles them. It's what, it's what comes out that defiles them. Because what the words that you speak come out of your heart. See, part of the whole kingdom message that Jesus is bringing is a shift in what people think is most important. It's not just the outside. It's the inside. It's not just your thoughts, but it's your heart. You can do the wrong thing, but if you deal with the right heart, you get credit from God. And you can do the right thing, but if you did the right thing with the wrong heart, no brownie points for you. And so when God desires to save humanity. He maps out the whole gospel plan. He sends his eternal son and he puts him in a manger. It doesn't make sense. As a matter of fact, the whole idea of the virgin birth, it doesn't make sense, but it's what he did. And in your whole walk with Jesus, there's a lot of things that will not make sense. So stop trying to make reasonableness a requirement for God's will in your life. Stop trying to make logic a requirement for what God will tell you to do in your life. He works outside the box completely. And if you and I are going to mature as children of God, if we're going to mature and, and shifting from being more independent to being completely dependent on him, the shift has got to take place in our hearts. We go back to saying, yes, daddy, whatever you say, I believe because my daddy said so. Yes. We have that innocence again. And he reveals things here. Because this is where we know God. This is where we know God. And this is where we impart to other people. When you're around a, a person who could be, you know, really, really, really smart, they, they, they can transfer information to you, you can learn a lot from them. But, but there are some things uh, that, that if you want to be like a person, you have to be around them. You have to be around them. Because there's some things that you'll, that you'll catch from being around them that you won't catch just by them talking to you. Well, what is that you catch from just being around somebody? You catch this. You catch this. I think that there's a very, very important reason why Jesus um, is inside of you. Why you have his presence with you is so you can catch this. So he can be this in you. God is not after your obedience. He's after your heart. And when he gets your heart, the obedience thing won't be an issue. When we try to obey him without the heart in it, that's, that's what religion is all about. Right? I'm doing these things because I feel like I'm supposed to, obligation, a sense of duty. That's what religion is all about. And Jesus Christ didn't die so that the world would have one more option to choose from amongst the world's religions. He died so that we would be living flames of the Father's love on the earth. And, and for us to go deeper into that, it won't be here. It'll be here. So this is why you can sit at home and, uh, and just be in, be, be, be in complete silence, right? Whether you're praying or not, just, just sitting there. And God could deposit something in your spirit. And it's undetected by your mind. 
This is why even in an atmosphere where we're singing worship to God, he can lift off burdens off of people just like that. He can bring healing just like that. It doesn't make sense, but it doesn't have to. And, and in our hearts, we got to get to a place where we embrace the it doesn't have to make sense lifestyle. That's where we'll be able to go further in him. Because our hearts can go further and deeper in God than our minds can go. And whatever your heart discovers, you bring your heart back and you tell your mind, this is how we're thinking now. <laughs> this is how we're thinking now. Yeah, right? God, 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 is, God just experiences love, his grace, is, he, he's so good. But what about that un un unanswered prayer? Oh, no, no, this is how we're thinking now. This is how he is good. We can't explain everything, mind. We can't explain everything, but we know he's good. We know he's good. We know he loves us. But what about the bad things that happen? No, no, we, we know he loves us. We can't explain everything. But we know he loves us because we've experienced some stuff that is deep and it's real and it's true. And this is what we're living by. And so, you've already done this to some degree. You've already gotten past God's plan of salvation and all the things that don't make sense about it. Right? Virgin birth. Baby in a manger. Dying and coming back. Things that can offend the mind. He does a lot of things that just offend the mind. Do you remember when John the Baptist was in jail? And uh, and he said uh, he sent some friends because he's about to lose his head. He sent some friends, hey, go, go ask Jesus. I just got to make sure because I'm about to die for this thing. I need to make sure that he is the one. And Jesus said, go back and tell John what you've seen. Blind healed, dead raised. Go tell him what you've seen. And then he makes this interesting comment. Blessed are those who are not offended by me. Blessed are those who are not offended by my ways because they don't understand stuff. If I'm John, I'm completely offended. Cousin, holla at your boy. I'm in jail. Are you not going to come visit? God, I'm going to die and you're not going to come visit? I baptized you. <laughs> and you're not going to come visit? You're not going to get me out? You're not going to come and say bye? You're not going to come and say thanks for getting everything started? You're not going to come... Blessed are those who are not offended by me. And you and I have many opportunities to be offended by God. To be disappointed. To be angry. What he did or he didn't do, allowed or didn't allow. We have, we have, we have plenty of opportunities. Because things don't make sense. The whole Christmas story doesn't make sense. I would have planned it differently. <laughs> I mean, I mean, seriously. You know, man, the whole the whole sky would have lit up. I mean, there's been this chariot coming out of heaven. Like everybody would have known this is the Son of God coming. He didn't do it that way. All the details of the whole Christmas story show he doesn't do it our way. And as you grow in him, embrace that he doesn't do it our way. And the sooner you embrace that, 
the less offended you'll be. The sooner you embrace that, the further with him you'll go. The sooner you embrace that, the more of him you'll see. Because contrary to popular opinion, information does not bring transformation. It can invite you to it, but it doesn't guarantee it. Transformation has to do with you opening up your heart, yielding it to him, and saying, use me for your glory, whatever it looks like. And I want to receive your love here. And if I can understand everything that you do, I want to receive your love here, internally, in my spirit, in my heart. I want to receive your love here. So you have a greater capacity to experience God's love here than you do here. Does that make sense? <laughs> First John 4.16 says, And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God. And God remains in him. We've come to know and to believe that God is love. So when Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, he's, he's talking about more than, um, than having paperwork completed. Although that's necessary for us to be like adopted into his family. Like there's, there's some paperwork there. But I want to share this with you. I, I remember uh, Heidi Baker um, sharing this story one time about the children that she's adopted in Mozambique. Okay, and we're talking about orphan, orphan mentality and then those who know that they're sons and daughters of God. She goes, you can come to our house and you can tell with all the sons that we've adopted, you can tell who knows that they're sons and who still thinks as an orphan. Those who know that they're sons, when they want something to drink, they go right up to the refrigerator, open it, pick out what they want, because they know that everything that I have belongs to them. Those that are just as adopted, just as part of the family, but they don't know that yet. They say, I'm thirsty. Can I get something to drink? Well, yeah, sure, you can get something to drink. Are you sure? So being a part of a new family is more than the paperwork, although the paperwork is necessary, right? Jesus did it for us. It's all paid for. The cross did it. We're in a new family, but now there's a different way of thinking, you see. In order for us to take full advantage and experience the full benefits of being in a new family, the family of God. Jesus Christ was sent to the world so that we could be in the family of God. And now in this new family, we've got to learn that the refrigerator contents belong to us. But what causes that shift? Once we're in the family, what causes that shift from the orphan mentality to the idea of the sonship mentality? It's the experience of love and a love that brings and communicates security and comfort, and peace, and protection, and belonging, and identity, and significance, and value. Well, that son knows there's no issues between me and mama and me and daddy. 
I can go and get what I want. What's theirs is mine is provided for me versus those who go, I, I know they say I'm in the family. I know what the Bible says about me being in the family, but I'm not so sure still about God. What if I make him mad today? What if I have this? What if I? And so there's the experience of the love that's missing. And so it's here when we open up our hearts to experience the love that God has for us as a father, that is what is transformational and doesn't have to be completely understood. It can just be experienced. And I'm telling you now, in the days ahead, there are going to be some things that God will do in your life that cannot be explained with your mind. And I want to be open to those things. I don't want to limit my life and my experience of God to just what I can understand and explain. I want all of him and everything he wants to do and everything he wants to say and everything he wants me to experience. But that means a shift. And I say, God, fill me here. Even if I don't understand it here. Take me to those places here, even if I can't understand it here. And so as we move from being orphans to sons and daughters, the shift takes place here. It takes place here. So from the very beginning of the Christmas story to the end of when time is over, God's not going to do things in a way that make us that are understandable. It's right here. He's concerned with our hearts. And the changing of our hearts, the yielding of our hearts. Let me close with this. Um, how, how many of you all are, are UFC fans? Uh, there's a few of y'all admitting it, all right? Okay. Uh, the rest of y'all just watch on pay per view. Um, all right. So there's this thing when people are wrestling, there's a contest. Uh, Ultimate Fighting Championship, that's what UFC stands for. It's a contest with these two guys, different fighting styles, and one's trying to win over the other. There's this thing called submission, where maybe you're, you're wrestling the person and you pin them in such a way that they can't move. Okay, now old school, you'd be like, just say uncle. <laughs> right? That's submission. Okay, say uncle, say uncle. I can't move. Say uncle. No, say uncle. Uncle! You know, you're going to break my arm! Well, they, call it, they call it submission. However, I think that's the wrong word to use. It's the wrong word to use. And oftentimes, when we use the word surrender, we talk about surrendering to God. And, um, but I'm, I have a military background. When people surrender, it's not willful. They surrender because they can't resist anymore. They surrender because they're outgunned. They're outmanned. They can't help themselves. If they could, they would still try to do that. Sometimes people in hospitals, prisons, when it comes to God, oh, God, I give up. I've been running and you finally caught me. I surrender. Here's the thing. He's not after your surrender. Submission is when you see a person's character and you willfully choose to bring yourself and all your resources under that guidance and direction. Submit yourselves one to another, right? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Submission is different from surrender. Surrender is I, I don't have any fight left in me, so I give up. I'm yours, Jesus. Submission is like what we see in the New Testament. You're the master. You're the Messiah. We're following you. I know what I'm doing. There are other options I could choose. I'm denying those options. I'm choosing you. There are things I don't understand, but we're choosing you. 
when Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, and folks turned away and walked away, he turned to his disciples and said, are y'all going to leave too? Because you're going to understand what I just said. Are y'all going to leave too? He said, they said, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. We don't understand why you say crazy stuff all the time. <laughs> but we're in this thing with both feet, and we're not turning back. They're saying, Jesus, you got us here. You got us here. Does he have you here? Let's all stand. I want to pray for you, and um, and I, I would if you just just whatever uh, sign of submission you want to yield to God, whether it's having your hands up or. Whatever, but the main thing is not just physical posture, but it's the posture of your heart. But I want to pray for you that we would yield our hearts to Him, that we would yield our hearts to Him to be to, to be filled with His love, to be the place where He changes us and transforms us. That's what I want to I want to pray over us today, Father. We thank you so much for Your Word. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. In this season of, of Christmas time, we're celebrating you sending your son into the world so that we won't be orphans anymore, so that we have a relationship with you, so we will be not just saved from hell, but saved for you. And as we yet walk here in this earth, God, we're wanting to make spiritual progress. We realize it's not about learning more things in our head, but it's about you being changed in our, uh, changing us in our hearts. That's where your love will overflow. That's where your peace comes, that surpasses understanding comes from. That, that's where we're comforted by your spirit. Father, we're asking you to help us to offer our hearts to you in such a way that we are, 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 are open to experiencing you in a way that goes beyond what we can understand. We want our experiences with you to dictate how we think and how we live. We want to go deeper into your love and our heart can go further than our mind can. So we want you to change how we think. We want our experience with your love to change how we feel. We want our experience with your love and the depths of it to change how we live. So God, we offer our hearts to you. The target of your transformational love the target of salvation, the target of, of how you, where you want us to live from and exude you into the world. So as we live in a missional lifestyles to, to see our world around us change, your love is going to come through our hearts. It's going to come through our hearts into the world. It's going to come through our hearts into the body of Christ where the world sees how we love each other. Father, fill us with your love, the love that you have for your children, your sons and your daughters, the love that sent Jesus all the way to the cross and resurrected his body. Fill us with your love so that we don't have to act like Christians, but we'll actually be followers of Jesus Christ and let Christ emerge from who we are in an effortless way where people can see him in us without us having to try. They'll see him in us without us having to strive. They'll experience him in us without us having to work hard to make it happen. We want this to be who we are, not who we're trying to be, but who you are forming in us. We want your spirit to produce this fruit, not from our flesh trying to squeeze it out, but your spirit producing it through us naturally and supernaturally and consistently and faithfully. God, we want to be the visible image of the invisible God, just like Jesus was when he was on this earth. This is our prayer, God. We want to see more people come to know you through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.